Hey guys, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, we really are glad that we get to do church with you. And I know we say that every single week, but uh, we're very sincere when we say we're glad to do church with you guys. And June 28 is coming quickly and we can't wait to see some of you again on June 28. And between now and then, make sure you stay connected with us, at least on our online platform. But we want you to know that we still stand ready, whether it's virtually or in person, to serve you and encourage you, pray with you, whatever you need us to do. We stand ready to uh, be the church, even though right now we can't be together. But thanks again for being with us right now. Uh, there's something that we want this community to know, and that is that we really do love you. And uh, we want to um, uh, show you that we love you in the way that we serve you. So if there's anything that you need, we would encourage you to let us know. On our website, on the very front page, there's a link that simply says need assistance. And if you need anything, let us know. And as much as we can, we would love to come alongside you and support you in that manner. Also, we just want this city to know that we love the city. And especially in the midst of this racial crisis that's going on, this is a perfect time for the church to step up and show our community how much we love them. And so we wanna do that. In fact, if you get on our website, on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page, you will see an uploaded video that gives this community our response to the current racial crisis. And also in that video is some uh, some options, some suggestions, uh, as well as some plans on how we as a church can uh, be the tip of the spear in terms of how we can fight racial injustice and be the hands and feet of Jesus. So make sure you get online and you check out that video and be up to date. Also, I want to remind you, this is a great time to stay up with us on all of our social media platforms. On Facebook, we're going to encourage you to follow us there. On Instagram, like us, follow us. And then on our YouTube channel at Brookside Church FW, you can subscribe and you can be up to date on all of the other videos and messages that we have uploaded thus far. But again, that's where you can keep up with us. Speaking of online, there's a few things we want to direct your attention to. First of all, every Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m., Pastor Yul Martin is hosting a, a prayer gathering. And especially in this time of craziness, we encourage you to pray with us. And you can do that in a community uh, setting. Also, for those of you parents who are looking for some content, some curriculum, some um, resources to encourage and lead your kids right now, we've got some great resources for you. Simply look for the parent blog on our website and uh, Kelly and her team have put uh, all kinds of good stuff up there. Uh, I want to remind you um, that um, we have every Sunday uh, a service ready for you at nine o'clock, just like you're here right now. And even though that's going to shift to a 930 and 11 o'clock service, when we get back together, we let me encourage you to invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, have a watch party, host some people over your house, make them breakfast so that this Sunday and even next Sunday, um, you, we can do church together in community. I also want to take a moment and just say thank you so much for your continued generosity. We cannot move forward with our mission and vision of Brookside Church without your, um, without your help. And so let me encourage you to continue doing that. We, we really need you to come alongside Brookside, partner up with us, and, and move this vision forward because we really do believe the best of Brookside is yet to come. And we believe we're not gonna get there without you. And so there's some very easy ways that you can give online. You can give on our app or you can give on our website at brookside.org. You can simply click the give link and you can give very easily that way. You can also continue to give in person. You can send your gift in or you can uh, bring it into the office. Uh, but thank you so much for your continued generosity and we encourage you not to give up. So thanks again for being with us. You are here for a great service. We can't wait to do this with you. So thanks for being with us. Let me pray and then we'll jump right into the worship, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you for the morning. And we're glad that we get to do church together, even though it's an online platform. And we are looking forward to June 28 when we can get back together again as a family. But until then, I pray that you will bless each of us. And as we engage with the worship, I pray that you will be high and lifted up on our praises, that our hearts will be encouraged. And we dive into the message. I pray that you will bless Pastor Yule as he brings it to us. And I pray that you will prepare our hearts and minds for the truth, the encouragement, the insight, the motivation that we will receive to follow you on a deeper level. Thank you for this day. It belongs to you. And we're just glad that we get to live in it with you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. It's your breath. 
Lord, you are so great. God, we just thank you for the breath that you first gave us, the first breath that you put in our lungs. God, and we just return that breath to you this morning. God, we offer it up to you as our worship. There's so much to worship about you, God, your goodness, your kindness, your graciousness. And we just lean into that this morning. And we ask that your presence be near to us and that we would be aware of your presence. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Brookside. I am Pastor Yule. Uh, I am the Connection Pastor here at Brookside, and I'm so happy to be sharing from the Word of God with you this morning. We have been in a series entitled Ask Us Anything. This series has been designed to be a series that really would take on some of the tough questions that we're dealing with in today's time. And today, I can't think of a better time to have this series running because our world has truly gone absolutely nuts. Um, uh, did you ever think you would see a time where you could walk into a bank with a hat on, sunglasses, and a mask, and nobody gets alarmed? You walk into our grocery stores or any other place of business, and you see people walking around with masks on and avoiding each other as if though we all have COVID-19. Um, and so, yeah, as you take a look at that, um, the world has gone crazy. We have racial tensions that's happening within our country. And in fact, not just our country, but across the world because of injustices that are happening within the United States of America. And you have people who are trying to peacefully protest against injustice. And then you've got insurgents that are coming along and, and destroying businesses and, and starting problems and riots and so forth. The world has gone crazy. But this isn't the first time that the world has gone crazy. The Bible speaks about a time, believe it or not, where the world was even more crazy than it is right now. And so this morning, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, you want to take that out, turn to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be walking through verses 1 through 11. And we're going to be trying to answer the question on Ask Us Anything this morning. And here it is. I want to try to answer this question. What do we do as Christians when the world goes crazy. What do I do as a Christian when the world goes crazy? Well, what should I be doing? That's the question that's on a lot of people's minds because these truly are the times that try men's souls. And so we want to hear from the Lord what he wants us to do. And so let's start right there with um, your Bible in Genesis chapter six. Uh, and we're going to pick it up right at verse one. The Bible simply says, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans or in some translations it says, the daughters of men were beautiful and they married uh, any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not always contend or strive with man or humans forever, for they are flesh or mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time or evil continually. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man or a just man, some translations say, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Um, as we go back and we take a look at um, this passage in Genesis, what we find is that the world in Noah's day had just gone absolutely crazy. But this isn't anything new. If you think about this, Jesus himself had something to say about the days of Noah. He said this um, in 
chapter uh uh, chapter 24 of Matthew and verse 37, he said that his return for us will be likened to the days of Noah. And so what did he say about what the world would be like right before he returns? What did he talk about with that? In Matthew chapter uh, 24, let's pick it up at verse seven. He says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows or in this translation, it says the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. The love of many or most will wax or grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 gives us some other insight as to the days that we're living in that are crazy. He says that in these days, there's going to be a great falling away and people are going to follow false teachings and violence and doctrines of demons. And as I look at how crazy the world is today, beloved, I got to tell you, I really do believe that we are living in the last days and that the world has lost it and Christ's return is imminent. I am not a prophet to say to you Christ is going to come back tomorrow, next week or next month. But I can promise you this. He is going to return. And he said his returning will be likened unto the days of Noah. So let's break down the scriptures and talk about. What in the days of Noah was going on that made the world for them so crazy? And then we're going to compare that to today's time. And then we're going to talk about what we can do as a result of this and some practical things that we should be doing as Christians when the world goes crazy. Because I believe with all of my heart that we can stand in the midst of a crazy world. I believe we can stand in the midst of a crazy world. And we can do that by simply learning some lessons from Noah. Let's go back and let's dive right into Genesis verse 1 and 2. It says, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all of whom they chose. It's an interesting passage of scripture because in this Reading at first, you don't kind of understand what's going on until you really dig deep and you look down inside and you see exactly what was happening. Uh, what causes us to really look at this is this idea of the sons of me, uh, sons of God. What does that mean when he talks about sons of God? Well, there's two thoughts that come from this thought of sons of God. One school of thought says that this would have been the godly line of Seth who then married in with the ungodly line of Cain. And so what happened was you had Seth who were just basically church boys who were doing good and, and just righteous and just and walking up right. And then they look down the street and they see that Cain still has some daughters around. And they were, of course, the uh, unchurched girls who were unsaved, who drank and smoked and danced and partied. And why they just came and got together and married each other. And then all of a sudden the world just went crazy and they start having giants in the world, in the land and, and the world became violent and so forth and so on. That's one school of thought. The other school of thought comes from the whole idea of what sons of God are called. Um, it pretty much says that these sons of God were angels who came down then and cohabitated with women. That's the other school of thought. So we get that from simply this. In the Hebrew, when you look at the word sons of God, it comes from two words. The first word is ben, which means son, and then Elohim, which means God. Um, here's how the terms, by the way, are used in the Bible. As you look at the terms in the Bible, um, it's used pretty much for a direct creation of God. Let me break it down to you like this. You and I are not a direct creation of God. We have a mother and a father, right? We have a belly button that tells us that there was an umbilical cord that was attached to a mother. And so we're not the direct creation of God. This word um, being Elohim, though, is used three times in the Bible or three ways in the Bible. And it's used to really talk about that direct creation of God. Here is the first way that it is used in the Bible. It is used of angels exclusively 
exclusively in the Old Testament. Basically, in Job chapter 1, verse 6, uh, verse chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 38, verse 7, when it says the sons of God came before the before God. Remember that in the book of Job. Well, that's the same word here, being Elohim. It's meant for angels. And the angels are not born. They are a created being, right? Um, in the New Testament, it's also used for Adam. Remember, Adam wasn't born. Adam didn't have a mother and father either. Adam was created by God, being Elohim. He was a son of God, right? And so it's used um, to talk about Adam in Luke chapter 3, verse 38, because Adam did not have a mom and dad. He was a created being. And then, by the way, it is also used of new believers, of us as believers. We said that um, he gave us the right to become what? The sons of God, this being Elohim. And so... But that's not talking about us as a created being. That's talking about us as a new creation in Christ. So because the Bible goes on to say that um, in John verses 1 and 13, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, that we're not born of flesh nor of the will of man, but we are born how? Of the spirit. Um, you remember Galatians says, and then also in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that we are a new what? Creation. You get that? We were created new spiritually, even though we are born from our mom and dad and not created physically by God. We're created in the image of God. Don't get me wrong, but we're not created physically by God. We're created by mom and dad. So this word Ben Elohim seems to be indicating that what was happening was these angels were coming down and they were cohabitating with um, the daughters of men with women. And they were having these these Nephilim, these giants, these strange um, sort of um, beings that were walking around the face of the earth. Um Peter and June, Jude seemed to confirm that strange things were happening, that the world really was going crazy in these times with these angels. Listen to what Peter says. He says, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved who? Nor one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in. Um, the flood on the world of the ungodly. And so as we take a look at look at what was happening during this time, Peter seems to say that there was some strange thing that these angels was doing and God then had to deal with them. But he gives us the time frame for that. He says that happened when? During the days of Noah. Are you following me? Then Jew gives us not only the time frame, but Jude tells us then what the crime that was happening. He tells us the crime that was committed during that time. Listen to what Jude says. He says, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. That's the crime. He has reserved an everlasting change under gloomy darkness for the judgment of the great day. And here's what they did. Here's the crime that they were committing. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and uh, pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So Peter tells us this was happening during the days of Noah. Jew comes back and tells us they were basically, these angels left their natural state. They came down and cohabitated and started having sexual relations with the daughters of men. Now, the pushback you're going to get from these two theories is this. Well, truly, if Seth was, if this is talking about Seth's godly line marrying Cain's ungodly line, then you got a little bit of a problem there because why didn't they all get in the boat and get saved? Only eight people got saved, Noah and his family. So if they were so godly, then why did God destroy them in the flood? That's the problem you're going to have with them. Others would say, well, you have a problem also with the second theory. The second theory comes from, you remember when Jesus was being challenged by the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection, sorry, um, Horrible attempt at humor here. Uh, they were Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. So they said, well, this guy marries a lady. And then, of course, they go on down the line. He dies. Then the one brother dies. And then he dies. And then on and on and on. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? 
And Jesus makes a simple statement. He says, well, in the resurrection, they are not given in marriage. They are not marrying in the resurrection. So in the resurrection, we're not going to be married. As much as you might uh, love your spouse, you're not going to be married to them in the resurrection. Now, listen, if you are tired of that rascal, you can rejoice over this scripture because you won't have to deal with that rascal again when you get into the resurrection. But what he did not say is they don't have sex in the resurrection or they don't have sexual parts in the resurrection. Listen, when Jesus died on the cross, was in the grave three days and rose again, he went into the grave as a man and he rose as a man. Right. So it didn't say he wouldn't have sexual relations or that there would be no. Jesus didn't say there would be no sexual relations in heaven. He just said there would be no marriage. So I think that both things, uh, no matter which way you take, um, it's not an argument for us to depart over. But that is the philosophy. So I'm going to go with the second one and say that these were angels that came down and were cohabitating with men because Jews seems to indicate that that was the thing that was happening. So if Jesus is saying these are the days that are like the days of of Noah and we know that in Noah's day two things were prevailing one that was violence in the land we know that from Genesis chapter 6 he said it was a very violent time and we know that from Jude it was not just a violent time but it was a time like Sodom and Gomorrah where you had these horrible immor immoral sexual things happening during that time we know that that's the reason why that that's the reason why God chose to lock those angels up Listen, Satan is still walking about like a roaring lion, but these guys did something so horrible. The world was so crazy back then that he locked them away in gloomy darkness. So something was happening there that made that time crazy. How do we compare that to today if truly we are living in the days of Noah? Well, let's just take a look at some statistics that I want to share with you about sexual sin in our day and time. One of the things that we notice in our day and time as it relates to sexual sin is, listen to this, Over, on average, couples will spend three and a half years living together before marriage and nearly nine, nine out of 10 couples, 89% live together in some capacity before they get married. Here's another statistic for you. Um, well, there we go. Six six percent of people cohabitate because they don't even believe in the institute of marriage. They don't think marriage is a necessary thing, so they end up living together instead of getting married. About three percent of America's weight, Americans, listen to how low this number is in America. Only about three percent of Americans will wait until marriage to have sex successfully. That's uh, people alive right now in the U.S. alone who waited, found love, got married, um, got married. Um, and then had sex for the first time after they were married. We use this little known word that you don't hear mentioned in society today at all. And that's called virginity. We are not waiting on uh, saving ourselves for marriage. When, when you, in fact, when you mention virginity to anybody, it's almost like mentioning a foreign word. You're almost ridiculed for saying that you're going to stay a virgin until you get married. That's the world in which we live in that are likened to the days of Noah. Um, and then what about violence as we look at violence? Um, oh, let me do one more thing here before I get to violence. In the United States, more than 65 million people are currently living with an incurable STD. An additional, get this, this is startling to me, an additional 15 million people become infected with one or more STDs each year, roughly half of whom have this infection for the rest of their lives. That's because we are now a society that is sexually promiscuous. The whole idea of saving yourself for marriage is not an admirable thing. Well, what about violence? What about violence when we go to that? Um, when you look at violence, um, it says here, violence causes more than 1.6 million deaths worldwide every year. How does that relate? Here's how it relates. Violence is one of the leading causes of death in all parts of the world for persons ages 15 to 44. So people aren't dying uh, mostly from cancer or, or some disease. They're, they're dying uh, basically based on violence. 
And so finally here, then violence is on the rise with almost five-fold increase in fatality since 9-11. 9-11 was a very violent time with terrorism and all the other stuff going on. And what we find then is that in these days that are like the days of Noah, we see sexual in, uh, promiscuity going up and we don't hear people honoring marriage and God's laws. And then we also see the, the rate of violence rising as well. So it begs the question, right, as we're on this um, series, Ask Us Anything, what do I do when the world goes crazy? What am I left to do when the world goes crazy? Well, my suggestion to you is that we start looking at the word of God. My suggestion to you is that we start following what God's word tells us to do, because I can promise you these days are as wicked as the days of Noah. I've only pointed out two ways that the world has gone wicked like the days of Noah. And I'm sure if you go just in the corridors of your own mind and you start to think about the world in which we live today, you can find plenty of more things or you can find plenty of more stats to talk about how violent and how sexually uh, uh, promiscuous the world is today. And so what are we to do? How are we to behave? How did Noah behave? So let's take a look at Noah and let's talk about Noah and his life and let's try to learn or glean some things from the life of Noah. I think the first thing that Noah realized as you look at his life um, is that Noah was able to accept his position in God. Noah knew who he was in God. Um, he accepted that position. Right. So um, when you look at that in Genesis chapter six, verse eight through nine, the Bible calls Noah this. He says Noah was just and the NIV it says he was righteous. Um, basically, he was a justified person. Now, listen, justification for the believer in today's world and even in Noah's world comes through faith. Right. Um, it's through faith and believing Abraham believed and he was what? justified or he was just you and I believe and therefore we are what justified and we are just uh, before God this justification by the way has nothing to do understand what I'm saying to you it has nothing to do with my actions this isn't a practical justification this is a positional justification because I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I am positionally placed at, a, at the seat of Christ. And I am, as Jude says to me, presented faultless before the throne. That's justification. Justification doesn't happen when I become perfect. Justification happens because God made me just it doesn't say that Noah did something to become just God is the one that called Noah just Noah didn't call himself just God did that you remember in first John chapter 1 and uh, verse 7 through 9 he talks about the blood of Jesus if anybody confesses their fault um, God is faithful and just to forgive them and not only to forgive them, but to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. That cleansing is written in the perfect present tense. It means that cleansing goes on through eternity. And it also says in the next verses that the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what makes us just. Not the actions that we do, but the position that we have. And let me just say something to you, my friends. You are never going to be more righteous than you are right now, positionally. Let me say it one more time. You are never going to be more righteous than you are right now, positionally. Because you didn't put yourself there by some action other than placing your faith in Jesus Christ. He, when you put your faith in him, positionally put you at a place of perfection. That's why Jude says, now unto him who's able to do what? Present us faultless before the throne. That's a position. I am positionally faultless before the throne forever. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, um, and verse nine, he says to us um, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's what God was doing. That's not something I did. It's something God did for me. Listen to this other verse. So then as through one transgression, there resulted in condemnation to all men. Even so, one act of righteousness, Christ dying, being resurrected and rose again, there resulted justification of life to all men. I am justified because I put my faith and my trust in God. Noah in his day, as crazy as his day was, 
put his faith in what God told him and God called him just. And let me just say to you, my brothers and sisters, when God puts his grace upon you, because the Bible says Noah found grace. Noah didn't earn grace, Noah found grace. And when God puts his grace on you and me and we find that grace, he justifies us and gives us a position of that. We, it doesn't mean that we have to do one more thing. I know a lot of us think, hey, if I just do this one thing right or I just do that one thing right, God is then going to show me his favor and his grace. No, 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 no. You don't have to do anything to earn this. By grace, you have been saved. It is a gift of God. At least any man should boast, right? You have been saved by grace. God's grace is God holding from us that which we deserve, which is hell fire. And mercy is him giving, I'm sorry, mercy is him holding back from us what we deserve, hell fight. Grace is him giving us what we don't deserve. And that's this being called out of darkness into the marvelous light. That's having life more abundantly. That's what God gives us. So if we're going to deal with crazy in this world, the first thing you have to realize is who are you in Jesus Christ? Who are you positionally in Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith and trust in him? Well, if you have, you can deal with crazy in this world. By just simply realizing you are a child of God. And by being a child of God, that means you have to act like a child of God and you have to behave yourself like a person of the kingdom and not a person of the world. And so my suggestion to all of us is realize our position in Christ and realize that that position is secure because I did not put myself there. He put me there. Noah was just and found grace in the eyes of God. But he didn't just do that. It's not just enough to say I'm saved. It's not just enough to say positionally, I know I'm going to die and go to hell. God calls each of us then because we are saved to take action. Faith without works is dead. He wants us to take action with our justification, right? That's called sanctification. Sanctification is where Paul says you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, that's what Noah did, did he not? Nor, the Bible says, stood for righteousness. And so that's the second thing I want us to think about doing as we think about how do we behave ourselves or what do we do when the world goes crazy? You stand for righteousness, stand for holiness, stand for what matters that comes out of the word of God. When you see stuff that's happening that's not biblical, stand up against it. I know that's not popular preaching today. I know that everybody today wants to just talk about the love of God. But do you realize God's flip side of his uh, love and his mercy is justice? He wants you to be angry, but here's how you be angry. Be angry and sin not. And so you have to stand for righteousness. That's what Noah chose to do. Listen to what it says in Hebrews uh, verse uh, chapter 11 and uh, verse 7. It basically says, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things, listen, not yet seen, that's faith. We believe in things that we don't see. Look at what he did. He moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to his faith. So Noah didn't just rest on the fact that he knew God. God gave Noah some marching orders and Noah then did, went forth and he carried out those marching orders. And so must we. Just because I'm justified don't mean I stay at justification. I got to move to sanctification. That's what Noah did. Listen to what he says. He was moved by godly fear. Notice in Genesis chapter six and verse nine, where our sermon comes from today. Listen, where verse nine says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Notice it doesn't say Noah asked God to walk with him. That's a difference in philosophy and mindset when you're asking God to walk with you as opposed to you walking with God. See, I think the world goes crazy and it goes crazy for Christians because, quite frankly, my brothers and sisters, we're too busy out here asking God to come walk with us. Instead of saying to God, where do you want me to walk? Where are you going so that I can walk with you? The, we're not, listen here, we're not here to change the Bible, as my brother would say to me. The Bible is here to change you. We've got this thing just a little bit twisted. We're always asking God like he's some kind of servant or butler or something to come walk with us. No, I don't want God to walk with me. I want to walk with God. Wherever God goes, that's where I want to be. And so that's what Noah did. Noah walked with God. 
And then Noah did all that God asked him to do. God, listen here. Listen how crazy the world was. You got all these crazy, violent, sexual things happening around Noah. Noah's looking at all this stuff and Noah's thinking, man, the world is going nuts. And what am I to do? And God whispers in his ear and says, I tell you what I want you to do. I want you to go, Noah, and I want you to build an ark. Because it's going to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights and I'm going to destroy everybody. Here's the, here's the key with that crazy thought. There, there had never been rain on the earth the Bible said there was a mist that came up and watered the earth. There was never a drop of rain on the earth. And he tells Noah to build an ark. Well, what the heck is an ark and what's it for? But you don't hear Noah questioning any of that. Noah takes the time to make that ark just like God told him. God gave him specific things to do because he was walking with God. He heard from God and then he started to do what God told him to do. That's how you survive in a world of crazy Find out what God wants you to do and to do that. Here's what the Bible says. He did all that God told him to do, but he didn't just do it in his own mind. It says very clearly he did it according to all that God commanded him to do. So he did. Don't do what you want to do. You do what God commanded you to do. How do you know what God commanded you to do? Well, you do that by studying his word and then following what his word says. And then not only that. There comes a time in this world that we live in of crazy that you just have to stand for righteousness. You have to challenge the wrong that's being done. You can't be afraid to do that. Too many times we don't want to offend somebody. Well, let me just tell you, Jesus said offenses are going to come. They're not coming from Pastor Yule. Pastor Yule is just simply telling you what the Bible says. So if the offense is coming, it's because one, either you don't know Jesus Christ and you're fighting against his word or two, you know him, but you're living in rebellion because you, you and I live in rebellion and we don't want to follow the word of God. Noah didn't care about any of that. Noah preached righteousness. Can you imagine this? Noah preached righteousness and his family was saved. So here, Noah, there's never been rain on the earth, right? We don't know what an ark is in Noah's day. And Noah's sons are growing up and they see some beautiful women down the street and they start dating them. And, you know, the Roman mill's going on about Noah, about how the crazy guy's talking about something called rain and the earth is going to be destroyed. And he's preaching against the stuff that everybody else is doing, by the way. So I'm not sure why Noah's so upset about what's going on in the world. He, he's the goody two shoe thinking he's better than everybody. And so everybody's ridiculing Noah and, and giving Noah a hard time about this ark and this rain that's going to come and all this stuff that's going to happen. And then Noah brings home the little girl. Right. And he's falling in love with her you know I've been telling you I got a little secret for you kind of haven't been telling you about you know the family secret here and she walks in the house and she meets Miss Noah and it's like oh yeah well I'm, I'm whoever I am you know I'm uh, you know me and your son we're in love with each other and you know Noah and, and, and Miss Noah look at them and say oh yeah what they wow what a good couple our boys did well every girlfriend they brought home each son Sham Ham and Japheth bring home these girls and the first thing they look in the backyard they think is whoa What's with the ocean liner in the backyard? <laughs> oh, that's your dad? I didn't realize this was your father who keeps talking the crazy stuff about rain and is building this big boat. And by the way, he's not been doing this for a couple of days. He's been doing this for 120 years. Some of us don't want to talk for 120 seconds about the word of God. And here this man did it for 120 years because he stood for righteousness. And what kind of faith and righteousness did he instill in his boys and then in his wife and then into their wives that they all understood what God wanted them to do? And they got on that boat. They got on the boat. And so how about you and me? How, how are we standing for righteousness? How are we persevering in this day, in this wicked generation that we live in? Are we calling sin a sin or are we compromising? Are we trying to be perfect as he is perfect, or are we making excuses to continue to sin? What are we doing in our own lives? I contend to you that we are to be moved with godly fear. We ought to do all that God has commanded us to do, and we ought to stand up against sin and unrighteousness. Because that, my friends, is how you survive when the world goes crazy. You can't go by every whim and thought that come your way. We trust in the word of God and that's what we're going to follow. And so Noah, he was just in all of his ways. He stood in obedience and God called him righteous. But there's one last thing we can learn from the story of Noah. 
as it relates to what to do when the world just absolutely goes crazy. And here's what you can do. You can get saved, you and your household. You can be saved, you and your household. And I want to just talk a little bit about saving, right? What does it mean to be saved? So here's how it happens. When I don't know Jesus Christ, I just simply confess that he is Lord and then he's faithful and just. He forgives me of my sins. And then he says, whoever um, calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right. If we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart, the Lord Jesus, that he is Lord, we shall be saved. So if you've done that, you are saved. If you haven't done that, I'm going to recommend at the end of this message that you do that. I'm going to show you exactly how you can. So the first thing is we got to make sure that we are saved. Right. So Noah was saved because he made the choice to put his faith in him who never fails. Even in the midst of this crazy world that Noah lived in, where you got angels coming down and sleeping with the daughters of men. You got violence throughout the earth. So much so with sexual immorality and violence and the other things that could have been happening during Noah's day that God decided he was going to destroy everybody by a flood, including the animals. Everything in his mind had just gone off the rails and become wicked. And so then God decided that he would destroy. But he came to Noah and he said to him, I want you to build this ark and I want you to build it a certain way. Right. And Noah became the heir of righteousness. Hebrews said because he believed and did all that God wanted him to do. And so at the end of the day, Noah is standing there. Right. And Noah's preaching to these people about how unrighteous they are. And Noah's telling them, hey, you better come on in this ark because it's going to rain. It's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights. God said he's going to come back. He's going to destroy it. And beloved, God said to us today, he's not going to destroy it ever again by a flood, but he is going to come back and rain down fire in the the last days. Jesus has said he is going to come like a thief in the night and we better be ready Right. Keep your lamp trimmed and burning and be ready for his return. Are we even looking for the Lord to return? Noah was. And because Noah knew that he was telling everybody, you got to get saved. And the sad part is after 120 years of Noah preaching that people needed to be saved. Nobody listened to Noah. Only seven people heard the gospel message that Noah preached and got in that boat. Only seven people got in the ark. Eight if you include Noah. And so we're preaching today to people and we're challenging people today and people are laughing and saying, well, you know, my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother talked about Jesus coming back. I don't think it's going to happen. And how dare you believe in a flood? You believe God created stuff in six. Then you go back to Genesis and people are ridiculing us all over the place. And so as you go into all of this and as you think about getting saved, Noah, finally, God said to him, come into the ark. Come. It's time, son. Take you, your wife and your kids and get into the ark. I want you to notice a couple of things that happened as this story ended before the flood came. God gave the invitation to come to Noah. He says in verse seven, verse one, then the Lord said to uh, chapter seven, verse one, then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You stand out only because you name the name of Jesus. You don't stand out because you are goody two shoe. You don't stand out because you're perfect. You don't stand out because you get it right all the time. Neither do I. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. But here's the difference. We heard God's voice and we answered it. Even in the world of crazy, we answered God and Thank God we did because God is the one that in Jesus Christ was reconciling us to himself and he invited us to come in and we heard that invitation. If you're out there and you don't know Jesus Christ, here's my question for you. The invitation still stands strong. There is still room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's room for just one. Because let me tell you something, not only have I been saved, not only am I being saved through God's sanctification process of me, but I'm going to be saved one day when he cracks that sky and he comes back for me. And I don't want to, I, you know, I heard a song that I used to listen to growing up and it's called Millions, right? Um, it's by the wine and it says millions didn't make it, but I was one of the ones that did. He says, I'll just begin to cry. He'll wipe the tears from my eyes. I'll say thanks and he'll ask why. 
And you know what my reply is going to be? Millions didn't make it, but I was one of the ones who did. I will not be missing that calling. I will not be as those, as John says in the book of 1 John, that shrink away at his coming. I'm going to run to my Lord and Savior, meet him in the middle of that sky and be happy that I did. I will be like Moses because he gave the invitation and we came in. He's given that invitation to you. Come on in. Come on in this house. He wants you. And the last thing I want to say to you before I close this out and give the invitation is this. I want you to notice one more thing. There's so many things we could talk about through the story of Noah. I've only given you a snippet of them. I suggest you go back and read uh, the Genesis uh, 6 through 9. A great story of Noah going to Hebrews and Tim uh, sorry, and to, uh, Peter and Jude and, and Double check everything I'm saying because it's a great story. But here's the coolest part about the story to me. When Noah was invited into that, that boat, did you notice that there was only one door? There was only one way to get in. There wasn't all these different alternatives. And then two things I want to say about it. One way to get in and God was the one that shut the door. Beloved, there's only one way to Jesus. The Bible says there's only one name given under heaven whereby men can be saved, and that's the name of Jesus. We can argue all day about whether you believe other religions or not, but I'm telling you, we do not have time for that. God is coming back, and when he comes back for us, he's going to hold us accountable for the deeds done in this body. And if the blood of Jesus cleanses your sin, then you are safe and saved. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be what? Saved. If anybody enters that door by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. When Noah got in the boat in that ark, the Bible says God shut the door. And I'm so glad that it's God who shuts the door, not me, because we tend to want to compromise. Maybe Noah would have heard those screams and said, ah, maybe I closed that door too early. Maybe, maybe. As we look at, at answering what are we doing in this world today, if Noah was here and in his day and time, maybe he would have said, I shut, I shut the door too early. Or maybe he would have said, oh, that sounds like Frank's voice out there. I'm so glad he's out there because he would come in here and cause all kinds of problems. God doesn't do that. When God gives the invitation, we come in, we are sealed with the promise of his spirit, and he shuts that door that we can't go back out. We can go in and out freely and find good pasture. We don't go out to that burnt up dirty pasture anymore because God has saved us and cleansed us. So if you're out there today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you are finding yourself far from God, let me extend the invitation to you. There is still room at the cross for you. Though millions have already come, there's room for just one more. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ, just simply follow with me. All you have to do is confess in your heart that Jesus is Lord. So here's what I want you to do. If you want to accept Jesus Christ, there is a little button there that you can click that says I accepted Jesus Christ. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to just simply say, Jesus, I believe that you are Lord. I believe that Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is God. Jesus is Elohim. If you do that, the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that thing that Jesus is Lord, you shall be. Not that you got to go do something and let me think about it. You shall be saved. When the thief was on that cross and he accepted Jesus Christ and said, just remember me when you get, he said, this day shall you be with me in paradise. So if you've given your life and your heart to Jesus Christ, let me just say to you right now, the ark stands as a testimony that we are saved, that we are shut in and we are secure. Because he gave us the invitation and you accepted it. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for being with us this morning. I hope you found this message to be helpful. We have answered that question. What do you do when the world goes crazy? Thanks so much. And until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
Thank you guys so much for being with us on our online worship experience and we are so glad to do church with you guys today. Let me encourage you before you go to copy the link of our site and share on your online uh, platform so that your friends, your family, people across the country can be with us next weekend. And we are hearing more and more of people all over the country engaging with us on our online experience. But we also want to encourage you if you have questions or comments or concerns, let me encourage you to email us at 
hello at brookside.org and we can respond to you as soon as we can. Thanks again for being with us. We will see you next Sunday, 9 a.m. right here on this online platform. Have a great day.